This video is sponsored by Fast Hosts. Viewers in the UK have a chance to win the ultimate tech bundle, including their dream PC worth up to £5,000. All you've got to do to enter is answer a question of my devising. More about that at the end of the video. Links in the description. Take a half full jar of honey and quickly turn it upside down. You'll notice that a bulge forms in the surface of the honey that grows and falls downwards until the honey collapses into the bottom of the jar. That's because the honey on the top, air on the bottom arrangement is unstable. It's actually an unstable equilibrium. That is to say, if you could get the surface of the honey to be perfectly level, you'd have a really precarious equilibrium. Any slight perturbation in that perfectly level surface would grow into a droplet that falls down and eventually all the honey would collapse to the bottom. If by some miracle I were able to create such a precarious unstable equilibrium with the honey on top, I certainly wouldn't want to shake the container because that would introduce perturbations in my perfectly level surface. But it turns out counterintuitively that if you shake the container in just the right way, you can actually stabilize the equilibrium. In other words, you can maintain a more dense fluid above a less dense fluid by shaking the container. It's actually something we've known about for 50 years, but I only came across it recently because a group of scientists were working on the problem. They've actually added a couple of really interesting counterintuitive elements to the literature. I wanted to see if I could recreate the effect for myself. So I spoke to one of the scientists, Benjamin Apfel. This is the a vibration generator I already have. It seems yep. like looking at the video uh, of yours, it seems like yours is maybe a bit more powerful than this one, but I don't know. Yeah, ours is like uh, 40 kilogram and uh, it huge power, but... Uh... It turns out I probably need some really specialist equipment to get it to work. I'll probably do it one day, but thankfully, Benjamin and his colleagues have very kindly let me use their footage. And actually, they've captured some really nice video. So here's their setup. Instead of honey, they're using another viscous liquid, silicon oil. I've got a little boat floating in there as well. I'm just gonna pause the video for a second. That hum that you could hear, that's 120 hertz. That's because the container is being pushed up and down 120 times per second, and you hear that as an audible frequency. The reason you can't see the container being pushed up and down is because the scientists are filming it at 60 frames per second. 60 divides into 120 perfectly, which means every time the camera takes a frame, it sees the container in the same position. So it looks like it's not moving up and down. That's the stroboscopic effect. I've talked about it in previous videos before, so I won't go on about it too much here, but I'll leave links in the description and in the card for those videos. Side note, you might be now wondering why we're not seeing rolling shutter artifacts in the scientists' video, like I've experienced before in past videos. Like here, I'm using the stroboscopic effect as a kind of fake slow-mo, and look, that wooden rod seems to be bending and warping. That's a rolling shutter artifact. The reason you don't see that in the scientists' videos is because they're not using a rolling shutter. They're using a global shutter. The next step is to push a straw all the way down to the bottom of the container and then blow air through it. Look, the bubbles of air don't rise to the top. They stay at the bottom until they form a layer of air. And look, the liquid rises up and it's now resting on top of that cushion of air. Isn't that amazing? Here's a slightly different setup. The container's still being pushed up and down at a high frequency. It's just, it's not quite a perfect multiple of the frame rate of the camera. So you end up with this slow-mo effect, which is really nice. Again, air is pumped in at the bottom and the liquid rises up. But because it's not quite as stable as in the other experiment, some of the liquid falls down again. And look, that gives the scientists a great opportunity. Stick the straw in again and lift up a second layer. So now look, you've got two layers of air and two layers of liquid. How cool is that? So how does it work? Honestly, it took me a while to get my head around this one, but I think I've figured it out. Let's first look at a really nice analogy, Kapitza's pendulum. So here I've got a rod loosely connected to a vibration generator. You can think of it like an upside down pendulum and it has an unstable equilibrium point as well. So look, if I slightly perturb the rod away from its equilibrium point, it collapses. But it turns out that you can stabilize that equilibrium point by vibrating the pivot point up and down really quickly. 
And look, now if I try and perturb the pendulum away from its equilibrium point, it moves back. It's now a stable equilibrium. As another little side note, a friend of mine, David Atchison, proved in 1993 that any finite stack of rigid pendulums can be stabilized so long as you can vibrate that bottom pivot fast enough. David Atchison is a great popularizer of mathematics, actually. I'll leave a link to his books in the description. I actually made a video of the multiple pendulums version. It was about six years ago. The audio is terrible, everything's out of focus, but I'll leave a link in the card in the description anyway. I actually failed to explain why it works in that video, so I'll make amends now. Most of the explanations online set out the equations of motion for a pendulum with a vibrating pivot, and they solve those equations and show that there's a stability in the vertical position. But I always try to find an intuitive physical explanation if possible, I did find one paper that goes through it in that way. I'll leave a link to it in the description. But it goes like this. First of all, imagine a scenario without gravity. So I've got that set up on the table here. I'm gonna push the rod up and down from this pivot point here. And of course, when I say up and down, I mean relative to the orientation of the camera, not up and down relative to gravity. And look what happens when I pull the rod downwards. The rod tilts towards the vertical axis. And when I push the rod upwards, it tilts away from the vertical axis. So far, that's pretty intuitive. But it has important consequences. What it means is when the pivot point is pushing up from its lowest point, it's pushing on a rod that is close to vertical. Whereas when it's pulling down from its highest point, it's pulling down on a rod that is further from the vertical. And when you think about the pivot point's ability to rotate the rod, the orientation of the rod to vertical is really important. The degree to which that upward force and downward force is able to rotate the rod depends on the component of the force perpendicular to the rod itself. So look, when the rod is being pulled down, the component of that force that acts to rotate the rod towards vertical is shown in yellow here. It's the part that's perpendicular to the rod itself. Compare that to when the rod is being pushed up. The component of that force that rotates the rod away from vertical is also shown in yellow here, and you can see that it's smaller. In summary, the point is when the pivot point is pulling the rod down, it exerts a relatively large torque restoring the rod to vertical compared to when the pivot point is pushing the rod up, it exerts a relatively small torque pulling the rod away from vertical. So if you average that over time, you get a net force restoring the rod to vertical. So when we reintroduce gravity, so long as that net force restoring the rod to vertical is greater than the force of gravity, we get a stable equilibrium. How does this relate to the levitating liquid? Well, it really is quite a nice analogy. So think about this body of liquid that's being pushed up and pulled down. When it's being pulled down, it's accelerating downwards. If that acceleration is greater than acceleration due to gravity, then this body of liquid will experience negative G. It'll feel as if gravity is in the opposite direction. And of course, gravity has the effect of restoring a perturbed liquid surface to make it flatter. So as the body of liquid is accelerating downwards, that bottom layer is being flattened. When the body of water is accelerating upwards, it's gonna feel a combination of gravity and extra Gs because it's accelerating upwards. That's gonna have the opposite effect. Any perturbations in the liquid surface will be amplified. But just like with the pendulum, there's less for the upward push to work on. Like during the downward acceleration of the body of water, that bottom surface flattens out, so there are fewer and less extreme perturbations for gravity to act on during the upward acceleration. And so the net effect averaged over time is for that surface to even out. And once again, we end up with a stable equilibrium. The cherry on the cake from Benjamin Apfel and his colleagues is this inverted buoyancy. Isn't that amazing? It makes no sense until you think about it for a bit and then it makes sense again. And then you think about it a bit more and actually it stops making sense. And then you think about it even more and it does make sense again. Because 
the boat is less dense than the fluid. So this bit of the boat here that's submerged, actually submerged feels weird in this context, but anyway, the bit of the boat that's submerged is going to feel a buoyancy force upwards. But the boat as a whole is heavier than the displaced fluid, so that feels a force downwards. They cancel each other out and the boat is at rest, just like normal buoyancy, really. Except if you think about it some more, Actually, it's unstable because if the boat were to move upwards slightly, even more of the boat would be submerged. And so it would feel a greater upwards buoyancy force. And so it would move up some more and the buoyancy force would increase and it would move up some more. It's an unstable equilibrium. And it turns out, once again, that the vibration of the fluid stabilizes that otherwise unstable equilibrium. The details are a little more complicated, but the basic principle is the same. So I think I'll leave it there. This video is sponsored by web hosting company Fast Hosts. If you want to get your website up and running really quickly, then take a look at their website builder. The drag and drop templates are really intuitive to use and they work on mobile and desktop out of the box. So you don't need to know anything about responsive web design or anything like that. Though, if you are the sort of person who likes to get your hands dirty, you can stick your own code in there as well. You get three months absolutely free. And if you're not satisfied within the first 30 days, you can get your money back absolutely no strings attached. Fast hosts also have a cloud backup service so you can avoid that feeling of saving over a document with a blank document. We've all done it. You can try it for free with their five gigabyte plan. Viewers in the UK have a chance to win the ultimate tech bundle, including their dream PC, worth up to £5,000 if you can answer this techie question that they've asked me to write. What did RSS stand for before it stood for really simple syndication? Link to enter is in the description. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and I'll see you next time.